in the presence of God, I've really noticed that, um, I don't know if you have experienced this, I hope you have, that you can have all kind of problems. Has anybody here got issues? Anybody got issues? I mean, I, I see those hands. You got issues? I got it. You, you got issues. But, you know, when you come and, and you're trying to solve the issues, anybody here this week been trying to solve some of your own issues? I know some of you people. Don't, don't maybe call you out. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I know you've been trying to solve your issues. <laughs> but, um, and then you come to a moment like that when you're surely that sure that God is there for you. And anymore, like you don't want the answer in that moment. I mean, later on today, your brain will go back and you just want the answer, want the answer, want the answer, want the answer. But in those moments before God, I don't have to know the outcome because I know him. I don't have to know where I'm going because I know when I get there, he'll already be there. I don't know. I don't have to know. Uh, to deal with how I'm going to respond in the situation because in the very moment of the situation, God's going to give me the response that I need. You see, I have to have two choices in my life. Either I have to make everybody else shut up. You ever felt like that? Everybody just needs to shut up. You ever had that? <laughs> yeah. I'm going to make everybody shut up so I can be peaceful. Right? Or... I can become peaceful so that everyone will shut up. Ephesians 5 verse 18 says, Be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. The first thing that happens when you're filled with God's Spirit is that your mouth gets, gets loosed. It gets changed. But Jesus says, Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Now, and some of you, you speak and your mouth moves when you speak. And some of you, when you speak, your mouth doesn't move when you speak. But we still know what you're saying. We still know that tension. We still know that anger, right? And some people, some people spit their feelings and other people eat their feelings. But it says, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. And then we read last week in Colossians chapter 2, where it says, let the peace of Christ dwell in you. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And so if I get the, if I get the Spirit of Christ and I get the words of Christ... See, some people just want the spirit, and then they end up, they kind of blow up eventually. Some people just want the word, and they kind of just only dry, they dry up eventually. But if I get the spirit and the word, I grow up. The Bible talks about by grow by the pure milk of the word of God, so that by it you may grow up into him. And so when, if I have the spirit of God and the word of God active in my life, you know, because the spirit of God... Moved on people and they wrote the word of God. And so it's all one thing. It's all one, one flowing moment. And so it's like you're the paper. And you get written on by the word of God. But it's, he's a living, breathing person who breathes on you as he writes his word upon you. He breathes the breath of his spirit as he writes his words on you. And I pray that today, that when you hear the word of God today, it'll have the hot, fresh breath of God on it. Just as if the Holy Spirit leaned up into your ear and the Holy Spirit spoke his words into your ear and you still sense the hot breath of God on your cheek because it was God himself who was saying it. And in those moments, it doesn't have to be where everybody shuts up so you can have some peace. It can be where you have peace. And then nobody even has to say anything to you. Because you're so, you, have, you have so much peace by God's spirit. And never forget, you're most powerful when you're most peaceful. You're most powerful when you're most peaceful. Now that was just the gravy to get you ready for today. That was just the priming of the pump for today. Today, the message is called The Problem of Wineskins. The Problem of Wineskins. 
Johnny Brewer made me this this week. He made this, at, I must be in my office now, but uh, he made me this for this week. And this is more, it's actually kind of a modern version of wineskins. And it was something that the Spanish would call a bota. And they, the, the, the Spaniards would have carried it with them on their horses as they came in, um, came into the land and explored the new territories. And uh, the Native Americans would have used something like this, made out of some skins. In the Bible, in the book of Luke, chapter 5, in verse 37, and it says, And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. No one pours new wine into old wineskins. And, and you may wonder, if you guys have never been in a place, I'm going to stop the message just a minute. Uh, when, if you've ever been in a place where someone's translating, so that's what's happening in our room right now, someone's translating. We said we're happy to have translation going on today. It says, so no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Well, let's talk about the wineskins of the ancient world, of Jesus' time. The most favored way to create a container for wine in the time of Jesus was to take a goat. Now, any, anybody ever, like, hunted for something, you know, took care of something, brought it home, brought some meat home. You know, the, the people, they love to use the whole body of the animal. You know, you use everything. And so after they would have the goat meat out of the goat, they would save all the skin from the goat. And they would make sure that, that it was all intact. All the back was intact, stomachs was intact, legs were intact, everything was in, intact. And they would tie off the the hind, hind legs, and they would tie off the front legs. And then they would have the neck of the goat as the opening, the pore of the spout. And so they would use that whole body of the goat as about the right size. And the way they made wine in those days is they would take a, a large stone, and they would spend some time hewing out a center section of it. Hewing out a center section of a stone. They didn't have a stone they would uh, cut a hole into the ground and then line it with rock and then with plaster. But the preferred method was to use a stone because a stone would, uh, would, would trap all the grape juice properly and it, nothing would just soak in and they wouldn't lose it. And so then, then they'd have in the stone, they'd have a, a cutout in the bottom where they would kind of uh, you know, drill, not really drill, but get their way through there. And then have a big basin that went all the way around. And they would literally, with their feet, or with some type of a press, just continue to press those grapes. Press those grapes. Press those grapes. Say it with me. It takes pressure to make something good. Yeah. So they would press those grapes, and then all of the juice would flow out of that hole into that basin. And then they have big vats, and it would stay in those vats for about five or seven days until all of the lees, it's called lees, L-E-E-S, would just, would just kind of separate and would float down to the bottom. And then they would have their wineskins ready, that full body skin of a goat, and pour that into the wineskins and have it ready to ferment. Now, Somebody here is really smart, and you know what the product of fermentation is. What happens? What is it? What is it? Gas, right? What kind of gas? Good. What kind of gas? Anybody know the product of fermentation? Carbon dioxide. It takes two Fiegelsons to get a right answer. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so, carbon dioxide. And what happens when, when it off-gasses out of that? It has to go somewhere, right? To go somewhere? Of course, in modern days, they have these little, uh, have these big um, stoppers on top of the wine bottles, and, and you'll hear them going, psst, psst, in a winery from time to time. Psst, psst, in a winery. But at that time, the, the reason they used those skins was so when the gas expanded with the collagen in the skin of the goat, and with the natural flabbiness of the goat skin, you know, do you have some flabbiness in your goat skin? Yeah? Get some flabbiness of the goat skin, and the, he would just expand. And he would just keep expanding. 
And after about two months, can you see, can you imagine that goat skin made like that? I kind of like to see one. It looked like a goat skin balloon, <laughs> you know? And I guess some would seep out through the pores or something like that, but it, would, it had to be an awesome sight because they could carry it. How perfect and how natural, and then that goat skin was a, now that skin was now a container for the wine after it was the container for the fermentation. Let's go back to this passage. It says, no one pours new wine into old wineskins. This passage in Luke 5 is found in Matthew 9, it's found in Mark, two, Mark chapter 2, and this is Luke 5. And so these passages here, they're dealing with the concept of fasting, of fasting and prayer. Um, because they are asking Jesus, like, like we fast, not our, the Pharisees fast, and that's the religious leaders asking. We fast, and they would say... Um, John the Baptist, his disciples fasted, and they, the, the, usually the common practice in that time was to fast twice a week, two days a week, and then not eat. It's a good healthy practice, a good spiritual practice. And they asked Jesus, how come you and your disciples don't fast? And they had questions about other things too. And it was always questioning. They would see Jesus' power. They would see Jesus' is healing, and because in that same passage, he's healing people, he's doing all these things, and so they would they'd see the power, and then they would ask questions about the process. They'd see the power, and then ask questions about the process. And you can always tell you're getting kind of this religious mindset when you begin to ask too many questions about how that happened. What gives him the right to say that? How come she's able to do that, God? Why'd you let her to have that blessing, God? Why'd you let him have that power, God? How come she, he can make that money, God? How come she can do that? And, and you begin to put that on it, and then you bring that into church, and then in churchianity it begins to look like, well, well if he's a Christian, he wouldn't talk like that. If she's a Christian... She wouldn't spend so much. And then, well, what up with that church? And we know some of these other churches, right? Now, not us, right? But, but we know some places where, you know, if you don't stand up at the right time, sit down at the right time, you know, you know say the right thing at the right time and dress in the right way, you know. But just because we're not the traditional church with that traditional, you know, outlook on the externals doesn't mean that we are not the same old judgmental group of comparing people that love to judge, love to compare, and love to feel like maybe I'm better or maybe I'm worse. You know how I know that that heart still can be in us? is because I know you, right? <laughs> it's you know me, right? We can still be that way. We can still be that way. And Jesus is forever talking about what's inside the skins not how big the skin is. Is is there some good wine in there? Is, is there some fantastic fruit of the wine of the vine in the body of the flesh instead of talking about the body of the flesh? Because what's in will always come out. In will always come out. He says no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Now turn to the person next to you, touch them and say, do you have some old wineskins? Touch them and say, do you got some old wineskins? Now, let's talk about what wineskins are for us. What wineskins are for us. See, if you're going to do something to follow God, and I'm looking around here today and I'm seeing a whole lot of Christ followers. I know you are in different stages of your life and your development and your walk with the Lord. Some of you are like so excited. I mean, you have just been set free from something incredible and amazing. And you go to bed at night thinking like, thank God I'm not dead because I was almost dead, right? <laughs> and some of you wake up in the morning and you're saying like, oh, Jesus, I get to live another day. And I, I, you know, I thought that I would, I didn't think I'd even be here right now. And some of the others of you, you remember some of those times. You remember some of those times. 
And uh, we talked last week about being stable. How being stable is good. Being real good. And, and sometimes stable people look at exciting people and say, yeah, you just wait. You calm down eventually. You'll be like me. And sometimes the exciting people look at the stable people and say, yeah, I hope I never get like that. And you just, you know, you got what you need, but you're kind of boring, right? And it goes back and forth like that. But if you ever find somebody in life who's exciting and stable, don't let go. They come few and far between. And that's the problem of wineskins. What are the wineskins? See, you have to have a way to do something, right? We have a way we have church. And uh, you have a way that you get to church. You have a way you read your Bible. You have a way that you pray. Uh, you have a way that you tithe, right? You have a way uh, that you care about your family, right? Um, you have a way that you pray. You have a way for all kinds of things. But sometimes your way gets in the way of God's way. What we love to do is to have a purpose and something to do, right? We, we have a, God wants me to do this. That's great. And how am I going to do it? I'm going to do it this way. Do it this way. And then after a while, you're still doing the way, but the way's not getting you anywhere, right? That's in a family, you have these kind of these conversations, you know? Oh, darling, do you still love me? Pick up your dirty clothes, don't I? <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> That's a good way to love me, but your way is getting in the way of the purpose of the love. Darling, do you really love me? Give you all my money, don't I? Your way <laughs> is getting in the way of God's way of love. Did I step on any toes so far today? No toes? No stepping on any toes? Yeah. It says, no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins. Why would the new wine burst the old wineskins? Why? Because the old wineskins have already have a way that's getting in the way of making the new wine. They have a way that's gotten in the way. Why? Because they're already stretched. Have you felt like, have you ever said, I can't do that? I'm already stretched to the Stretch to the max. I'm stretched to the limit. You know what that means? It means I have a way that's getting in the way. <laughs> and I can't do anything else because I have to do absolutely everything I've ever done and do it the same way I've done it. And I can't do anything else. I have to do everything the same way because that's the way to do it. Can't do it. When I don't actually have to do everything that I've ever done or the same way, because the definition of Christian growth is to get a new way for old things. Anybody want a new way for some of your? Old things? A new way for your old things? The problem is, those old wineskins that have gotten so stretched in your life, you got some old wineskins. You have some ways, right? Got some ways? I got some ways. I got ways. 
I was in this week, I went to a pastor's meeting, you know, they were talking about how, you know, there was a need to help and deal with the growing problem in, 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 in families of Christians about, about, uh, about Alzheimer's and dementia and, you know, how that's a, you know, how much that's a growing big issue in life. You know, and, and what do you do when the, the child has to become the parent to someone? It's a hard thing. This older pastor was saying, this is what we teach people in the, in the Alzheimer's care. He says, we teach them ark. You know, like the Noah's ark or the ark of the covenant, but spelled A-R-C. We teach them A-R-C. He said, we teach them with the, with the elderly parents, grandparents, A-R-C. Don't argue. Don't reason with them. Don't correct them. Don't argue with them, A-R-C. Don't reason with them, and don't correct them. I was sitting there, you know, I have this mind that hears what people say and then turns it into something else sometimes. Anybody else have one of those? Yeah. And I, I just raised my hand in this big meeting of pastors, and I said, uh, hey, Pastor Don, um, I like that, but, you know, I, I don't have that much ministry with Alzheimer's or dementia. Would it be okay if I just took that and brought it home and, you know, used it with my wife or my, my children? Because <laughs> he said that, and I thought to myself, hey, you know what I do a lot of? <laughs> Reason. I told Hannah that. Hannah said, Dad, are you saying we have Alzheimer's? No, no, no. <laughs> I'm saying it's me. <laughs> it's me. I might give it to you, or you might give it to me one. You got some ways. You got some ways that it's getting in the way. Wineskins. Can you, if you're, are you sitting next to somebody this morning, and you're thinking about, thinking they have some ways that are getting in the ways? Raise your hand if you're sitting next to somebody and you're, <laughs> you did it. I can't believe y'all did it. That's awesome. That's awesome, man. You're sure, that's great. We'll sign you up for counseling afterwards. But uh, let's try it again. Let's try, try it again. Uh, raise your hand if you're sitting next to somebody that has some ways that's getting in the way. Yeah, 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 yeah. And now, would the other person like to raise their hand too right now? Go ahead. Go ahead. That means, yeah, yeah go ahead. Men, you can raise your hand now too. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, raise your head now too, yeah. Anybody have somebody that didn't come to church this morning and they have some ways that's getting in the way? <laughs> they got some wineskins, they got some ways of getting in the way, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna help you, I'm gonna help you with that, okay? I'm gonna help you with that. I'm gonna give you the answer for all of those issues, all of those problems. At least, it's at least 52% of it. 52% is a lot, right? If I could solve your issues with 52%, would that be helpful? Yeah? It might even be more than 52% for some of you. Your answer to their old wineskins, you know what your answer is to their wineskins? Is you need some new wine in your wineskins. That's your answer to their wineskins. The person, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus. Laura, I don't know if I should say this because it, you know, it's really me. Like, it's me, Laura. It's me. It's me. It's me, oh, Lord, standing in the need of prayer. The person that notices, focuses on, dwells on, tries to deal with other people's wineskins is the person who is always the most dry. Is that too harsh, Laura? It's okay? Okay, good. It's rough, right? What do you think about that? Yeah, yeah. Why? Because when you say, I can't take it anymore, you know what that means? You need some new wineskins. That means you've stretched yours completely out. 
You say, I'm stretched to the max. You know what that means? Ooh, you need new wineskin. You need something different. What you're saying when you say that is, I want something new, but I don't want to change. That's what that means. I want something new, but I want something new for you. I don't want to change. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins, otherwise the new wine will burst the skins. It's called a breakdown. Right? It's called a breakdown. You cannot keep stretching into the shape. Oh, listen to this. You cannot keep stretching into your old shape and be your new self, your new person. You cannot keep stretching and fulfill all the other obligations and become the new shape. That God wants you to be. Because the skin is not what blesses anybody. My way of doing it is not what blesses anybody. Me making sure they do it the right way is not what blesses anybody. Me making sure God does it the right way doesn't bless God either. What blesses? The new wine that becomes something better, something older, something enduring. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins, and the wine will run out, and the skins will be ruined. See, that's when you come to God, you're like, people come to church, they come to God, they're like, man, it's been, I just ruined my life, I need, I need, I need something good, I need something good, and they get new wine skins. Only after their old wineskins have been broken, busted, disgusted, and ruined. And you know how long they get new they get new wineskins, but how long is those new wineskins going to last? Right? The purpose isn't getting new wineskins. The purpose is getting filled, expanding, being poured out. And getting some more. It's not for me to be wineskins. It's for me to be a wine factory. It's for me to grow grapes. It's for me to be pressed. It's for me to be a, a fountain of living water. Not a place to hold old grapes. And then it says... Verse 38, no, new wine must be poured into new wineskins. Oh, God, send your spirit. God, I love that song. Not by might, not by power, but by your spirit, God. Send your spirit, God. That's good stuff. We can add another verse. I need new, I need new wineskins. My old won't cut it, Lord. I'm not going to make it, Lord. I'm ready to change. I need to be different. Or I'll be broken, Lord. I'll be so broken, Lord. I think I leak. I'm leaking a lot, Lord. I probably taste real bad. I probably taste real bad. I think I must stink by now. This old skin's rotten. Get rid of it, Lord. Oh, but see, if you get something new, then you're all better, right? See, it's not getting the new that counts. It's learning how to get new and then get new again and get new again and get new again. I've noticed in church, most, most people, a lot of people, I don't know how many, they'll, they'll go to one, we've got home team launches next Sunday, right? Kickoff day. They come to church, they're new in the first year, they join a home team, it's really good, they get close to people. Then, you know, we live in an army town. They take people away, right? Then other people backslide, right? And somebody else, you have an argument with them because, you know, you're both immature. And so, and so, 
<laughs> somebody else, you know, they got divorced. And, and you're like, you're like I, and you don't join, you don't, you don't do a new thing again, okay? Home team kickoff this next Sunday is about new wineskins. And remember, God never fills it till you form it. He always fills after it's formed. He created the world before he filled it. Right? He even created the womb before he put you in it. Right? So he finishes the passage and he says, verse 38, 39, sorry. And no one after drinking old wine wants the new. I had to really study this passage quite a bit. This little verse here. I was thinking, is he talking about, like, you should let it get old, you know, and then because that's good wine because it's old then? No. What he's talking about is this. Is that new wine, when it's newer, within its first couple months, it's, it's fresh, it's new, uh, but it's still got, it's a little bit more acidic. The longer it ferments, the more mellow it gets. The more stable it gets, right? Some of us are very stable. We're doing good, but we become very mellow, right? And once we get mellow, we get real stable. We get good to go. I mean, we're so stable. Horses follow us around trying to go to bed at night, you know? Um. Stable, stagnant, whatever it is. But after it gets so mellow, it tastes good, it's more mellow, it's not so hard to drink, but there's less of it. It's harder to get. It takes longer to get there. It's more expensive. And it might be nice but a whole lot of people don't get to drink. Feel me on that? A whole lot of people don't get to drink. You're not supposed to get drunk on it anyway, right? Ephesians 5, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. And so do you have some old wineskins? I was convicted about arguing, reasoning, and correcting. I can spiritualize that really good. I can take turn it like, man, that's just, I'm just prophetic. <laughs> I'm just, I just have strong convictions, Andrew. What do you think? I just got strong convictions. <laughs> I, I, I can turn those things real good and I can say God wants that, but God doesn't want that. God doesn't want that. How about you? You got some old wineskins? You may be a young person with old wineskins. You know, the number one way to change your life is to change your life. Right? I heard somebody say one time, now I, I might meddle for just a minute, okay? Can I meddle for just a minute? Okay. Like I, I'm an equal opportunity preacher, right? Right? This isn't any less sinful than this, Okay? This isn't any less sinful than this. Fried chick if it's chicken fried, it doesn't mean you're sanctified. Okay? I mean that. But I had a I went to a class on addictions one time and the guy said that a study research for years talked about the neurochemicals involved, which substance mean people's preferences for different substances and how that means that they have certain uh, lack of chemicals in their brain they're trying to reproduce with those substances. And so he said, um, he said, but we, he said, we found that when a person's getting in recovery and they're getting off all their issues, he says that, that the people who quit smoking tobacco too at the same time, those people are twice as likely to stay clean and sober than the ones who keep smoking after they're in recovery and I said why they said why why is it he said because it keeps 
the brain's dependency on, on a, you still have an addictive brain is what they said. What does that have to do with anything? That taught me a lot about me, right? Because I still have an addictive brain and I don't even smoke. Why? Because the number one way, time and place and reason and what they said was this. The number one way to, while, while you're getting sober, you could go ahead and get sober from everything. The best time to quit your addictions is while you're quitting your addictions, is what they were saying. Because it still keeps something alive. There are some closets in our lives that are some old wineskin closets. That the, not by might, not by power, but by your spirit can open that. And I fear for many of us that there's something in that closet that may come out one day. It's better that you go to the closet. You open it up and you face it yourself. Then it comes out and attacks when people that you love are standing nearby. What can you face today? And say, God, that's old wineskins. That was my way of coping. That was my way of coping. But God, I don't need that way of coping anymore, God. I need something new. And don't you dare think about anybody else in the room right now but you. You hear me? Don't you dare think about anybody but you. Because in your heart, in your life, what's it about? It's about you being so filled that you love them and their wineskin problem, but their wineskin problem doesn't create a problem for you. You love God and you seek God and say, God, I'm just going to be so filled, be so full, be so blessed, God, in my days, in my life. But the old wineskins have got to go.